Good afternoon, everybody, including Dan. Please sit down. <laughs> Out. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I remember when I was at university, I had a lecturer who said, if your phone goes off during the lecture, you have to stand up and sing a song. So you've been warned. <laughs> Well, 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 welcome to this, this session on fire. Um, I'm only going to talk very briefly, a couple of small introductory slides, and then we're going to set Morton loose. Oops. Sorry for those of you online, the physical participants have been locked out. Welcome. Do we need to wedge it open or something or? Okay. Rewind. <laughs> All right, will we, will we try again? We try again. Yeah, welcome again. Um, usually during, a, during the annual conference, we've got a mixture of some more kind of, um, I guess, health-related sessions, some more kind of higher-level management kind of sessions. And every now and again, we do some kind of deep-dive technical session. And this one starts off fairly, fairly lucid. And then is rapidly going to descend into into sort of nuts and bolts. So, if that's not your thing and you don't get it, we won't feel offended if you feel you need to need to walk out. Um, but yeah, what we want to talk really is a little bit about about where we are within the DHIS two strategic and tactical thinking around fire um, and mostly i want to introduce some of the tooling that we've been developing that makes it reasonably easy for people to do you know, all kinds of integration really um, but also including including fire and we show a few examples of that morton will do that Right, so I think most of you here, you know what fire is. Um, I can never remember exactly, I have to read it out. Fast health interoperability resources. Okay, it's a specification. Um, it's a, it's a fair bit of a moving specification. Um, it's gone through a couple of maturity levels. It's been maintained by, by the HL7 Fire Foundation, so it comes from from good heritage, I suppose. Um, it's been gathering support and traction within the healthcare IT industry, I guess particularly in the US, so a bit in Europe, and also things happening um, elsewhere. Uh, it's been gathering quite a lot of attention within, within our own sort of traditional communities, if you like, um, particularly the likes of OpenHIE, which I've been part of probably for the last, 10 years or something. Um, WHO, many of you will have, will have seen what was the digital accelerated kits and now the smart guidelines. Given the DHS2 footprint in the world, and sometimes I wish we didn't have it, but we do. <laughs> Given the DHS2 footprint in the world, it's quite important, it's, it's necessary in fact, that we have some kind of coherent, and pragmatic and strategic, um, and I should add helpful position regarding fire.
They're looking at it broadly. I know we've had long discussions with with who did we talk to? James Agnew from the, the Happy Fire server. Developers, um, we've looked at what they've done in the NHS in the UK. I had some chats with Epic engineers in the US from some years back. Um, and basically we've got two basic possibilities, right? We can take Tracker and Tracker's data model. Everybody hates the Tracker data model. Right, you know, you, you only get the right to hate what you don't, what, what you use. <laughs> We could just get rid of that and replace it underneath with a, with, a, with, a, with a happy fire repository. That's not really very likely to happen um, for all the same reasons that most of the other legacy systems, be they Epic or NHS, whatever they are, um, there's too much value already being, being drawn out of Tracker the way it is. Um, and also, it's not just used for health. I mean, we're also using it for education, forestry management. Um, so first option is not really on. The other option we have is to build what they call facades. So we have DHS2 and its data model there. When you have something there which provides a facade so that from the outside, it can read and write fire stuff. Uh, we've mostly over the last six months, I guess, developed quite a, a number of ways of building fire facades. And it was not really for us to do. We've, we've developed some tooling Morton's going to show you later, which is mainly to help people out there who are doing integration projects to use. Um, it's not just, in fact, for, for using with fire. It's for using more generally with integration. Um, but given that we're not likely to do the first one. We need to have much more focus on this, to drive much more discussion in the direction of using fire for interoperability, rather than thinking that somehow what's gonna happen is that everybody's gonna rip out their data model and replace them with fire repositories. As fire repositories talking to each other, that's like saying everybody's gotta use Microsoft Word. Right? It doesn't solve the fundamental interoperability problem of dealing with legacy systems that have to make facades. This is my opinion, by the way. This is this, this disclaimer. You can argue with me. Um, so a tactical approach. And I know some of you been around for a bit longer might remember probably two or three annual conferences back, um, there was this DHS2 fire adapter. Um, it was created by a very smart, very smart German guy by the name of Falker, who was working with us, unfortunately, for quite a short while. Um, Falker left and it was actually, it was quite hard to maintain. And I think that the approach that he took was maybe in some ways a little bit too clever. <laughs> Often what we need is something much, much simpler. Um, it's not dead. Uh, the repository has been forked. It's now officially maintained by ITI Nordic, which is Ranga's team. Ranga, where's Ranga? Huh? Ranga is not here, no. Okay, it's Adrian. Adrian, a Adrian's Ranga's stand in. <laughs> you have ITI Nordic. Yeah. So ITI Nordic is a is a company started by Ranga. It's is it's is kind of based with one foot in Norway and another foot in Zimbabwe. Um, in fact, most of the developers are in Zimbabwe. They had started using it in some projects, so they decided that it was in their interest to carry on with it. The other thing we've noticed quite recently is that the Open SRP project as well have taken that repository and forked it. And I think they're now calling it the Open SRP DHIS2 connector. That's okay, we're generous, we don't mind. Uh, in fact, it's good. It's good that all that work that was done has not been wasted, right? Um, and that there are folks still interested in doing that. 
what we've done, I suppose, within the, the DHS2 integration team, I should say, I mean, it's basically just, it's me, it's Morton. We recently got a full-time integration engineer, Claude, who I haven't seen. Ah, Claude, I thought you were hiding away somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and we've, we, we, we've quite a lot of people who are in and out, uh, who are coming from different parts of the DHS2 system, whether it be in Oslo, talking to the tracker team, talking to Rebecca in the packages team, and mostly talking to people in the, in, in the HISP groups. Because we'll talk much more tomorrow a little bit about architecture, but I mean, basically all integration, not some integration, all integration happens out there in the field. None of it happens here. The best we can do, really, I guess, is to try to find, provide tooling and approaches and, and patterns and friends, like our open function friends, um, that make it easier for people out there in the field who are solving real problems. Um, and that's a bit what we're going to show you today. A little bit of function of, of using some of this generic tooling to help people do fire stuff um, and not doing it in the sense of assuming that we're a fire repository because we're not. And there's always going to be some limits that result from that. Um, but in fact, we can do quite a lot. Um, getting data in and out of DHS2, I mean, it's very, very possible using fire. Um, if the fire has been designed sensitively, let me say, um, and it's really not so hard. Are you on from here, Morton? I don't know, do I have enough? All right, so that's a sort of brief intro for me about sort of general approach. I'm going to, Morton's going to show you lots and lots of, well, lots, I don't know, two or three inter interesting examples, I hope. Um, and hopefully we have a, we've got an hour, right? So we've got a little bit of time yeah, I think we will have some time for questions in the end. And, uh, my demo's not going to take that long. It depends on how it's going to be a bit of Java code. This is the, the warning uh, Bob mentioned before. Um, we start getting into that stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Does anybody want to ask me anything before we let him loose? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> ah, Manzi. Don't ask me anything difficult. <laughs> Oh, all the all the acronyms. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this space is full of acronyms. We even have DHIS too. <laughs> yeah. Now, all right. That, that, okay, FHIR. That's a that's a standard or an emerging standard that's that's developed within the HL7 community, which is traditionally the, the kind of consortium building standards in the healthcare sector. Open HIE is something completely different. Well, Open HIE is a collaborative community of, of different projects who are involved with, with, with providing different parts of a, of a health information exchange architecture. What was the other one? Open SRP. I don't know what Open SRP stands for. Um, Uh, it, 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 it's a project by a team called Ona. Um, they're based in Kenya. Um, they're doing quite a lot of fire stuff, quite interesting things. And one of the things that we've seen they've done is they've taken our fire adapter. Okay. Right, Morton. Can right. we? Do I need to take this off? Oh, you have your own. Put on mute. Uh, you want to shut find... me up? No. <laughs> how do I, I don't know how to put it. There should be a button for it. I think it's just on the top. Yeah, yeah. But you don't have to. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. So let's get started. Um, so the examples we're going to show today today is maybe not the most interesting ones. Uh, we've done this in the past. We're going to um, use something called um, MCSD, or we're going to use that as an example. Uh, so MCSD is basically for exchanging or, or organization units. So today we're basically going to take organisms inside of DHS2, put them into Happy Fire. But the approach is more interesting than the actual end, end result. 
Um, so to achieve that, we kind of have kind of developed or not developed, but chosen a, a new stack at, uh, for the integration team. And that kind of everything we do going forward, we're going to be using these, these comp components. Um, and we're going to use something called Apache Camel. Um, Bob could talk about that for days, I'm sure. We're just going to know it's, it's a basically a nice implementation of what's called the enterprise integration patterns. Uh, it's been around for, I don't know how long, 15, 20 years, for a long, long, long time. Um, so that's basically kind of the engine of everything that, that kind of that starts up the integration that handles routing, that handles decisions, that handles formatting of data, and so on and so on. Um, on, on, on another software we have selected, and you might recognize this from DHS2, uh, this is uh, ActiveMQ Artemis, uh, which is already supported in DHS2. We're using it for audits. Uh, so if you're on a kind of recent version of DHS2, maybe 235 and up, you're already using Artemis behind the scene um, because it starts up embedded in DHS2, uh, but you can also externalize it if you want. So that's basically used for queuing, basically. So if you have something in an asynchronous process, you want to push something to queue, and then you have one or more consumers kind of working on of, of that queue. Uh, it's a very, very common pattern um, when it comes to integration. Uh, so Claude, sitting in the back, our new integration engineer, he's been de de developing what they're calling the Java SDK, which is basically a client library for DHS2. It's, it's, it's a quite simple, but it just kind of takes away some of the hassle of talking to DHS2. Um, you're just creating a DHS client, and you kind of start talking to DHS2, and you're getting resources and so on. Uh, we also developed, uh, based on JSON schema, a bunch of classes, or, or organization units, and, and data elements, and so on. And then it has, has pointed to a specific version of DHS2. Uh, we're not going to look into that too much today, but I just want to mention that. Uh, there's a link here if you want to know more about the project. It's in heavy, other heavy, heavy development, so uh, there might be some bugs and so on, but it's, it's being worked on. Um, the next one, we created our own um, Camel component. So if you ever use Camel, you will see examples of this soon, but if you ever use Camel, you know Camel has uh, what's called components for all kind of stuff. That could be for mail, it could be for, for Twilio access, it might be for JMS, it might be for HTTP access and so on. That's kind of, it's, it's basically a way of accessing uh, some data, right? So for DHS2, we're saying, give me this resource on the DHS2 server, for example. And we'll see that soon. Uh, today, we will also be using another Camel component called uh, the uh, Apache Camel Fire component. And that's basically that what, what takes care of sending um, the end result after we're getting the organets and transform them and sending that to the actual Happy Fire server. It's a very nice component. I highly recommend it if you're using doing anything with Camel on Fire. It's, it's a very, very nice component. Yeah, this is a picture of the same as I just said. Uh, we don't have to go into that. I think we're just gonna jump to some examples. As I said, we got, we're just gonna focus on uh, a profile that's uh, that's uh, came out of the Open HIE um, people it's called MCSD. Uh, it's it's uh, it's um, again just an, a way of wrapping organits in in into Fire basically. That's kind of standardized version of doing that. Uh, in 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 Fire, you would normally call, create something called a profile. They kind of put, put constraints on resources. Um, so yeah, very, very simple. We're gonna start with something simple. There's a Java-based converter that will take um, data for DHS2, <clears throat> convert it using Java itself, and then I push that to Fire. Uh, we're gonna do something called a data sonnet-based converter, um, which is a language for doing, well, it can do a few things, but basically using for JSON to JSON transformations. So it's actually a, a, a language, um, it's based on JSON, but you can't have like with the for loops and so, so on. Um, you, will, you will see that soon. And then we will end up with the, the nice pub sub example uh, for Art Artemis. So this is the, the publish um, and, and subscribe model where we're using Art Artemis as the queue in the middle. So there'll be two, two scripts for that one. Uh, all the examples can be found on my, my GitHub. Um, if you want to know more examples, we do have some examples on the, on the, on the main DHS2 repo also. Um, there are not that many right now, but there are a few. Uh, I'll probably move my examples also into there at some, at some point, so we can kind of keep them in, in one, one, one location. So the last link is not an example repository, but it's actually something that's going under, going a heavy development, and that's our DHS2 to Rapid Pro connector. And that's just using everything you're gonna see today. So it's using Camel, it's using Data Sonnet, it's using all the things you will see today. So if you want to see a bit more real, a real example, and not just like a few, few, few lines, this is probably the, the place to go. What can I just add a little bit? Of, yeah. and, and that doesn't use Fire, right? The DHS2 to Fire, yeah. uh, to, to Rapid Pro. Um, 
more is going to focus on on org units but i mean there's quite a lot of other fire resources that, that we've got examples of um and probably the one that's going to be most interesting i don't know if we have anyone from his latin america or from paho ah. yeah we, we've been talking a lot with paho over the last six months or so i guess on 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 using fire questionnaires and questionnaire response so there, there is a questionnaire example in that integration examples uh, repository. But you're not uh, doing it today. No, we're not going to show you that yeah. today. Uh, there's also a patient example, a very simple patient example that just pulls up patients from DHS2 and puts it into Happy Fire. But those are very, very basic. It doesn't have any data or anything like that. But it can be a starting point. And again, what we're showing today is just an approach. So you can replace the organist stuff with patients or whatever, and it will be pretty much the same approach to it. Um, that's kind of the, the idea. Okay, let me just open up my things. So I'll probably have to. It's probably a bit small. <laughs> uh, let me try to zoom in a bit. Um, but it doesn't matter, I can just zoom in on the actual. So I'm not gonna go step by step on all the things here. I don't think that makes sense, um, but I will kind of give you kind of overview of the general approach. So this is the, not the one, let's start with this one. So this is, uh, this is the first example I mentioned. Let's see. <laughs> Trying to zoom a bit. Yeah, that should be okay, hopefully. So this is the first first example. Um, all it really does, it will start up a timer. In this case, we just something we just do once. So it's, it's not the cron job or anything like that. It's just a one-time thing because it's a demo. Um, naming the route can be useful, especially if you're gonna use something like Hot.io. So I don't think I've mentioned before, but that's kind of a monitoring tool for, for Camel and Acta MQ Artemis. Other than that, we are seeing an example of the usage of the DHS2 component. And that's probably the most interesting here is that you probably recognize this order and paging and fields. It's all from DHS2, from the, the field filtering API. Um, and then we're just setting that as parameters to the component. So you even know how to add that when it's doing the actual request. Uh, order is a bit, it's important here. Uh, you probably want to do that just because you get the levels, level one first, then level two, level three, level so, so on. So you, so you know all the parent pointers are, are correct. Um, yeah, there's a bug here, but I will not, not don't think so much about this right now. This, this is not required soon. Um, what is interesting here, um, I did mention that we have created models based on the, the, the schema. So in this case, we are actually pointing to a specific model in DHS2. So we're targeting a specific version of DHS2. Uh, you don't have to do it like this, but that's one of the approaches we, we kind of decided on uh, for, for this project. Uh, that means that you can also target 238. So if something was added in 238, you can just point to that 238 organization unit instead, and you know that will be correct, and you get auto completion and so on uh, for that class. And of course, the last one um, is the client. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you how that's set up. It's pretty straightforward. Um, as you see, it's, it's, not, it's not very far from, from how you define a Fafari client, but basically you're saying, you're doing a client builder, is saying the, the, <clears throat> the, the, the base URL, uh, the username and password and so on. Um, and I think also paths are supporting our cloud, right? Soon, soon, okay. So this, then this new personal access tokens that we have now in DHS2, they will also soon, soon be supported um, by, by this one. Um, so you see, you see username and password is probably not what you want to do in the going forward. And then we had, at the end, we are basically just injecting the client here. That's all. So now this component know the client it can, it can use. So you can have multiple clients. You can imagine a source client, a target client. If you have DHS2 to DHS2, for example, and then you just have uh, two, sorry, from DHS2 to DHS2, but with different clients. It's just the source and, and target clients. Uh, the next thing we do, uh, we do what's called a, a split. And all that really does is to kind of take the list of organization units and just gives you one by one, imagine like a for loop almost. Um, and then we convert one by one into the, the MCSD profile, which is basically 
allocation and organization. And you can quickly go through that. I'm not going to go through all of this code for this one. You can have a look at yourself if you want. Um, it's not much, but it's just too much to go through now. Uh, basically, you're setting up a camel converter. You're saying, OK, input is organization unit. And remember, this is the specific version we had as a parameter. And then you have the exchange, where you're going to get the body and the, all kind of stuff if you want. Then we're returning a bundle. A bundle in, in Fire is just like an atomic unit, basically, if, if you want. It doesn't have to be. But in this case, we're doing an, a, an, a transaction-bound transaction uh, bundle. Yeah. Uh, what's really important is this one. Just want to mention that. This is just so the Fire component know which bundle to actually send to the server. Right after that, we fire off the fire component. Uh, again, we're setting the the client. In this case, of course, the fire client. Um, we will get some kind of return. So whatever ret is returned from that transaction, uh, we'll, it's a it's a JSON. So we just marshal that JSON. Sorry, unmarshal that. Sorry, what well, we marshal marshal it. Yeah, marshal into fire version four, and then we just print out the result, basically. And, and, and in this case, it's all successful, but it might be some bugs that you might have some to, to try try retry logic, or you might have some exception handling, and so on, of course. Again, this is a demo, so we don't really, yeah. Sure. Uh, all of these things, like from and to and split and body and convert body into, those are all camel primitives. So when you're using Apache Camel, you get to the command completion on them. But you basically describe your route like that. And it can also be rendered in a graphical form so you can see your route as well. So Camel provides you with that sort of scaffolding for putting the things together. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So the, what's remaining now is to actually run the example. Um, I'm just going to check that play dev is actually open. <laughs> it, it, it goes down sometimes, so I just want to verify that. So I'm actually pulling it directly from the uh, play dev server. Yeah, it seems to be up and running. So good. And then I will start up a, a fire server. So I'm just using the the, the Happy Fire CLI. Um, the, probably not necessarily what you want to do in the production. You probably want to set up your Tomcat or whatever to have it run properly. Uh, but in this case, we are just using the the Happy Fire CLI. A bit bigger. So this is version 5.6.0 version of the Happy Fire client. Uh, just starting up a server now on port uh, 1990. Um, we are using version 4 of the Fire standard. Uh, version 5 is out, but I think version 4 is going to be the most used for, for quite some time to come. Um, and that's also what we're going to base our, ourselves on. Um, who knows? At some point, we probably want to move to five, but that's not not happening yet. So I'm just starting that up. This is an empty server. It'll take a little bit of time to start up. This one you can just download from from the website, by the way, and then you just run the jar file basically and and add the parameters. Uh, it's also available in apt-get, I think, and the brew for for Max and a few other things. So it's a very nice and simple way to get to start starting up uh, a, a, a file server, especially for the demos and so on. So I'm just going to refresh the page. So now we have a fire server up and running. Okay. And I created a configuration file, a Spring Boot configuration file for this one. So you can just have a look. You see, this is my kind of my setup. I think I actually changed the port, so I'm just going to change that to 1990. Um, the rest is not so important right now. Uh, I do hot I/O integration. We might want to look at that quickly uh, after. Um, but right now, this is kind of the basics using just the normal play dev server, admin district, and so on. Um, and we're doing a bit of in in introspection using JMX and this Jalokia. This is basically just get hot IO to work, which is again a UI, but we will show that later. Okay. <laughs> so let me stop it here. On. So we're now going to run, run this thing. Let me, is it big enough? A bit, bit bigger. 
so nothing too crazy. I'm just just building the project basically. Um, and then you see Spring Boot is starting up. And now we we are starting on now is already talking to play dev server. And soon you'll see a lot of text coming up. What these are the results? This is the, all the results from um, <clears throat> from uh, the, the five five server. Yeah, from the split. So it's just, again, it's a for loop. So we're doing one organ, one organ, one organ. Uh, I try to do it in one big batch, but Happy Five doesn't seem to be too happy with that always. So 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 it's it it seems to be a lot better to do many many small ones, and actually it's quicker anyway. So uh, so that seems to be the, the best approach to it. And you will see now. Uh, they all created, but because of the way I define the bundle, uh, I'm using a search parameter on it. So if you run it one more time, this is stop it, and you can run it one more time. And this is kind of a nice approach. This is, uh, you know, in DHS2, we have this create or update strategy, which is kind of the default. Um, and by using a search parameter for you put here, it will create if it doesn't exist and update if it exists. So now you see it's giving a 200 OK. And that's basically update. Okay, yeah. Actually, we're not actually updating anything in this case, but but still, that's how it will work. And we can also just verify. Um, so go into application and search. You will see now we have a bunch of locations. We also have organizations, and you can just have a look at a look at one. So you see, this is, yeah, this is on the okay. But there, yeah, you see, this is just the, the, the fire resource itself. Yeah. So that, sure, sure. Hmm. Hundred percent, yes, yeah. Uh, you will have some potential issues just because of the way DHS two works. The metadata, you need to probably skip sharing. You probably want to, if you have attributes, you probably want to sync those first. Uh, if not, it's going to fail. So you have to think, have a few considerations before you do that. But when 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 those things are kind of in sync, uh, yeah, you can definitely do this. You can do it like a nightly job or whenever you want it, basically. There is, yeah. We have something better coming up that you could also use. We have something we have, we're going to create what's called an eventing system inside of DHS2. So what basically what that means is that you, instead of kind of now you're just getting everything and pushing it into fire, you should be able to listen to changes of metadata and then you can react to those. So you say just, you just uh, maybe be part of the DHS component, you're saying just listen to DHS2, I want this type, I want this type. And then you will, every time this is changed, you will get a notice then you can do immediate sync. You potentially do real-time sync, although for organ it's probably not that important, but, but you, you, you could, you could, yeah. Partners, just because if anyone wants to ask questions, we, we love questions, but <laughs> point to Martin, you know, you come with the mic, because there's lots of people on Zoom who are yeah. listening. Okay. Hi, Martin, so just uh, so I understand, Camel is the way we are talking to the underlying fire transport mechanism. So Camel gives us the interface, is the API to that. In a way, yeah. So, so Camel is Camel is kind of the engine that runs everything, and Camel has a bunch of components built in, uh, and we have also created one of our own. But yeah, Camel is the engine of of integration basically, and it's a uh, yeah. What is fire giving you? And why do we need both? I guess my question. So yeah, okay, Bob can yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as, as, as Martin was showing at the start, uh, Camel has a lot of components. Camel has components to talk to AWS, components to talk to Kafka, you can talk to Slack, and it has a component to talk to Fire. So one endpoint in your route will be a Fire endpoint. Now what Claude has made us is also a component for talking to DHS too. And what Camel does is a way to allow you to string those things together. To do things like like the split. Yeah. I mean, before the initial version of that, he just read the org units from DHIS2 and sent them to fire. Now, when he realized they had a performance issue with the, the fire server, it was very simple in Camel using their primitives. You just say, well, split this. 
and it does that. So those are the kind of things that Camel does, is it gives you the scaffolding and a fire endpoint on one side and a DHS2 endpoint on the other. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so very much related question. So, would, if you wanted to put open image in this architecture, this is an example. Would that replace camera? Not necessarily. Um, you could do stuff without open him. Yeah, open him does provide some nice audit stuff and the like. Open him is built with mediators, and mediators can be pretty much anything. So you could build a mediator like this, this thing that Morton has just done, you could register that as a mediator within open him. So they're not mutually exclusive. No. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we, we gotta get off example one. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully a quick one. Uh, a little nitpicky, but uh, so the other attributes that exist in DHS to like location mm. uh, coordinates, for example, yeah. shape files, like uh, coordinates are supported by file location. Uh, then there's address. No, it's they're not the coordinates. Yes. It's not not no. polygons. No, uh, but they, 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 they said, uh, so in the I have an, another example in Python, and that's using the GeoJSON extension. We basically take the GeoJSON and then B64 it and, and you just say telling this this is a GeoJSON. Yeah. So the question is then is it really up to plot to decide what gets included or like if I wanted to say use this and I want to make sure that the coordinates get included, mm. can this now out of the box include those or it would need to be just like added somehow? So okay, so this again is just demos. Um the, the next step we're gonna look at is using something called data sonnet. This is basically a JSON to JSON transform, uh, which is probably easier if you don't know Java to modify than, than the Java code itself. So you can imagine having um, a general organits to location um, organization transform, and then you just point to your data sonnet. So we give you the data sonnet that's kind of out of the box, gets at least the job done, and then you can potentially add to that and kind of modify it if you want to use the coordinate field and so on. Yeah, that, that's definitely possible. Uh, although, for certain comp more complex use cases, I would still go to do the Java route because it's, you have more control. Um, but for simpler cases, definitely data sonnet could also do that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> the, this is the most exciting it's going to be, by the way. This is the only example that I've built around doing the same, but in different approaches to it. <laughs> yeah. You still end up with or 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 organist stuff, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this one is a little bit different approach to things. Um, not a huge difference. Um, you will see we're using another uh, component of Camel already also built in uh, called the data sonnet transform. Um, again, we can just start from the top. Uh, you will see it's exactly the same as before. We just again we're just getting organization units from DHS2, pretty straightforward. Uh, in this case, I'm not using the, the built-in organization unit class uh, that you also provide. I'm actually using my own class just to show how that's, that's done. Um, and in this case, um, since we're not using the built-in uh, iterator or the built-in uh, classes, we will have to split it ourselves. Because as you probably know, if you go to API organization units, um, there's like an, there's another level, right? So you have API organization units and there's organization units array, which actually has all the organization units. Yeah, so we're just doing, um, it's not showing here, but I can go a bit down. Basically doing very, very simple. We just, what's called a splitter bin and we're just returning the correct, what you're actually gonna loop. And you see, again, we're doing a split. So again, think about this as a, as a for loop. Um, since they're sending it a data sonnet, it doesn't have uh, knowledge of everything you're doing. So what we're doing, we're also setting the base URL. Uh, this is just so it knows um, the certain things you want to set when, when it comes to, 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 to the identifier, for example. You want to say, oh, this is identifier from this system. Uh, so we need this base URL. And I'm just removing the API part on the end there. Uh, I'm loading up a file from the file system called organizationunit.es. We will look at that shortly. Uh, and this basically transforms uh, all my organization units now into a map 
So this is just an object in JavaScript or whatever, just a key value. And then you end up with that. And then I'm simply converting that map into a string. And I'm deserializing it using FireJSON. So now I have an actual bundle, a real class, because the, the Fire component requires um, actual kind of re real classes and not, not just as a, as a string or a, a JSON. And again, we are just getting the result again and outputting it. But the interesting here is not that. The interesting here is the data sonnet file. Again, you might not want to go through all of this time. I just want to show you the general approach to it. As you see, this already looks like JSON, right? So you basically, you could almost start with just an example of how you want it to look. Then you start replacing the static parts with some the dynamic parts. So for example, I told you about, you can set the put two times and the first time you will create, the second time you will actually um, uh, update. And the way that, the way to make that work, you're basically putting on the search parameter here and you will see it's an object called payload that has a bunch, bunch has all the properties, right? It has name, it's ID and so on. So we're just adding that. Um, this is, again, we're doing it here, but I will show you kind of the, the, the main runner of here, the, the engine itself or the, the loop. Uh, this is another one. Obviously this is not um, valid JSON, but this is valid data sonnet. And it just checks if the description is there or not. So if it's there, it will add the property description. If not, it will keep it out. Same with the code. Uh, code is not a required field in these just two. So we add, we, but ID is, so we're always adding the ID because we always don't really have it. Then we're checking, is there also code here? And if there is, you will add it. Please be aware that this just two has very few constraints on the code field, but uh, Fire does has constraints on it. So in this just two, you can have, you know, um, H above five and you can have space between, right? This is not valid in, in Fire. And we can also have uh, all kinds of signs and ampersands and everything. That's not a valid identifier in Fire. So you need to be a little bit careful here. This is especially true when it comes to, to terminologies, option sets and so on. We are again, we allow almost anything. As long as it's not more than 50 characters, we allow anything in there. Probably allow emojis also. So yeah, sure. Are they gonna have to translate to back into English? <laughs> <laughs> The, the interesting difference between this approach and the previous example, and it actually came from discussions with Paul, um, that both of them are just different ways to map. Right? In the first, an, an integration is almost always about mapping at some, some level. The first example, the mapping was kind of done in the Java code. It's probably very efficient. But if in the field, they need to change something. But maybe there's a there's a there, there's a there's an attribute that is changed, or there's a new attribute, or in, in the in the in the Paho case, it's a questionnaire. Maybe there's a new questionnaire item. Then they can customize this file where it is, which means that um, with all the other all the other sort of Java stuff in place, it's driven by essentially a mapping file. But that's the main benefit of doing it with, with, with data. So it's got a few drawbacks doing it this way, but the real benefit is that you can customize it locally mm. without getting involved in programming. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's fine, that's fine. Let me just show you one more thing and then I think we can move on. Um, oh, no, sorry, I don't even have it at the sample layer. I was thinking I was doing the for loop, but we're actually doing one by one So in this case. So yeah, there's no for loop, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah. Again, I will just run it. Uh, it's not going to be that interesting. It's going to be the same again, but uh, ju just to show that it actually works. <laughs> and again, this is doing almost 100% the same as the Java code. It's just now using it as an external script instead. Um, oh, I didn't change the port today. I'm, I'm just updating the examples, <laughs> so we so we have it for later. Uh, okay. Yeah. Anyways, it will work as before. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. <laughs> for now, for now. So I have one last example. Um, let me just close down this one. 
So the last example requires Artemis, which I have here. The other example, not this example. Well, it has it, but it's not so interesting because you don't, um, yeah, anyways, whatever. If, 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 if there's time, you can also show up how, how hot I on, on them. Um, again, I'm just running up. This is just a normal Artemis. I just created um, a new instance called Duck Demo. Um, nothing special here. It's just starting up. There's no, no, I don't even use the authentication. Um, you will see starting up a port uh, 61616. Uh, this is the JMS port, and we're going to use JMS for doing the the exchange of uh, of, of data here. Okay, so before you do anything, I'm just going to show you the listener before the producer. So the listener is very very simple. Um, again, I'm using the first example here, so I'm using the Java based converter, but it could of course be using data sonnet here also. Very very simple. It listens to a topic called organets. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. Maybe it's a better description and maybe you need to namespace it, but for now we're just calling it organets. Uh, whenever there's some a new event there coming in, so a new organet coming there, we unmarshal it into an organization unit. Uh, we convert, convert a body just as before, sending it to the file client as before and logging out the result as before. So you can imagine replacing from here with these just to something something as our event system, for example, that whenever you click on something and organize, add, delete, or update, you can imagine just having a small thing like this, listening on that. Of course, not sending it to file in maybe, but sending it to DHS2. Yeah. So let me just start up that, that one. Yeah, that should be more modified, more modified, more modified. So when you, what you see now when it starts up is actually nothing happens, right? Because there's no events, there's no events coming in, but it's now it's connected to Artemis, just sitting there and li listening and see if there's anything thing happening. Just more this one and let me then open up the producer. I will also show the code. So this is the producer. Again, you, what, what, what you see I've done, I am honestly just took half of that out and put that in here and half, the rest of the route and put it in on, on the one. So it's almost the same as before, even the split to be in everything. The new one here is I'm sending it to Artemis using JMS. So we're not sending anything, we're not converting here. We're not doing anything with that. We're just sending it straight to, to JMS, which is uh, our, our Artemis server. And that, that's it, that's it. So let me just start that up. So yeah, let me actually open up two windows. So again, I will just kill this one. Then I can... So again, I'm just starting up the listener again, but it's in the twin, so we can see the, the two at the same time. Right, up and running, again, li listening. And now let's start up the producer. So again, it will just go to play dev, get all the organets. Now it's starting the loop and you will see, but this is all through the Ar Ar Artemis. But you can imagine not having one listener. You can imagine having five listeners to five different dishes to instances, right? So if you have a nightly job, you have one master facility list, for example, and you can imagine doing one update on, on the main one, but you're actually updating multiple servers, maybe also fire, maybe also not, not different system. You just create another camel component for that. And it works exactly the same. So now you have kind of a kind of decentralized the whole thing. So you kind of split it up and, and you do a very, very small route. It's just 10 lines of code almost, that's all. And then you have three lines of code on the other side for live listening, and that's it. So now we have this very dynamic nature and this can be real time if you want, because now we're doing just not yet, but at some point we'll be able to react to just small, small changes and you can actually push, push those out immediately. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't see that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure we can <laughs> show it off here. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> No, no. I'm saying the, the people online, they don't see your drawings. <laughs> it's really quite interesting the way his Rwanda has taken this up. Anyone from his Rwanda here? They're actually doing something quite similar now, but to solve another big problem that we have, which is real time generation of indicators how many covid case, or how many vaccinations have i done today we have we have problems with 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 program indicators at large scale as you know but in rwanda they 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 just looking at all the messages coming through on the artemis queue and counting the ones that are interesting to them and then they have them in real time and put them on a on a portal or whatever else they do to them Camel stuff is not just about fire. <laughs> Two quick um, questions. One is that if you're using it for the kind of synchronization you talked about later, is it possible here to simply have a synchronization that is semi-automatic, meaning that if you have, for instance, an update instead of an, something new, mm -hmm. that you can stop and actually ask the user, do you want this update or not? Because again here, I just know from experience that sometimes, you know, you're getting updates, which is actually wrong. Mm -hmm. or you're getting new things, which turns out to be duplicates. You don't want that duplicated org unit as a simple example to be spread into all the other instances. So that's mm -hmm. question one. The second question is, you were mentioning yourself that you have, in DHS2 has very few restrictions. And I mean, I compare yeah. it with DHS1, where I built in a lot of restrictions. You couldn't have double spaces, no trailing mm -hmm. blanks, no funny characters in data element names that can cause this, you know, ampersands and stuff that might crash uh, yeah. in HTML. And I mean, all of that, I generally blocked it up front. Mm. Uh, what I see in databases that I'm cleaning up is that it takes a lot of time, a lot of queries and fiddling, et cetera, to find, identify, and clean them up. Is it possible to use FHIR? Because you mentioned that FHIR has a, a, a different set of criteria for codes, for instance. Are those cr criteria customizable? So would it be possible to take, if I have 12,000 data elements, which has duplicates, but one has a double space, another one doesn't, blah, blah, mm. blah, blah. Would it be possible to send them all over to FHIR, have a range of customized restrictions on that, that actually auto cleans up most of them and then send them back instead of having to spend, you know, like three weeks going through yeah. and trying to find the 2000 out of the 12,000 that has a problem. I'm just asking. I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one first, and yes, that's possible. Uh, in 238, we have something called uh, metadata change approval. Uh, so it allows you to send, um, basically, um, you can request the saying, okay, this is a new name, for example. Then you send that as a, a metadata change um, request. And then there's no UI yet, but then you can go in there and you can accept that, UI, that, that uh, metadata change. I think it's only for organists right now, but that fits the case we're showing off. Uh, at, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that allows you to to kind of approve changes before they actually go live. So so that that that, that definitely would work. Yeah. No, no, no. Any 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 kind of change, any kind of change. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least create an update. Uh, not sure about deletions, but create an update for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, there will be a UI for that, hopefully in two to nine or so. Um, but but yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's definitely coming. That's definitely coming. The second one, I don't know if you want to <laughs> to take uh, Bob. Uh, but but in general, identifiers in in Fire they're not customizable, so they, they are kind of a strict requirements. They basically follow on the requirements of our UIDs. Cannot start with the number, must start with the letter, and then have a mix. They can be longer than these two, not eleven characters, but they kind of follow the same same kind of rules. So I don't think that would be a good problem. I would probably dump it into Excel, honestly, <laughs> as, as we always do. 
Uh, I think that would be a better approach to it. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to say to that, Bob, or if it's a better approach. Yeah. It's a little bit off topic, but it's <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. I understand the problem, exactly. Um, using fire to somehow address that problem, probably not the right way to go about it. If we yeah, could yeah. discuss that after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all people online. All right. Uh, in the HIV space for uh, USAID, uh, we're looking fire for interoperability right. from different systems, lab systems, logistics, uh, treatment, testing. Mm -hmm. uh, DHIS2 not having fire has always been a challenge because we're seeing countries uh, doing it the hard way. So right. this, this is really good news. But one thing I want to bring to your attention is we're also looking for third party fire testing as a service. Mm. Now, since you guys are creating this dynamically through mapping, mm. uh, I, you, know, I, I, you don't have to answer it now. If we bring in a third party as a service for fire testing, how would it work in your scheme of things? So I mean, it, yeah. So, so whenever you have a, have a custom, so I assume that's using some custom profile defined by the um, some of the parties here, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I don't. Know. I, think, I think we have to wind up. Yeah, we're hitting two o'clock. <laughs> a last comment on that. I mean, what we've seen a lot of places now are. Getting into business of developing fire profiles. Um, Indonesia, we saw Papo, Ethiopia. It's really, really important that we don't create these things as mathematical abstractions up in heaven and hope that they are somehow going to work in a system. Um, profile development ideally should be done hand in hand with implementation. Like in the early days of TCP IP. Well, you create a new variation on the standard, it needs to be demonstrated that it works. But we could talk for many days on this, but unfortunately, I think our time is up. Yeah. I think we have so, else so, so thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody online.